Hello, and welcome to St. Paul's. Today is Ash Wednesday, the first day of the season of Lent. Traditionally, the ashes we place on our foreheads come from burnt palms from the previous year's Palm Sunday, the dramatic beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross. Today, we burn palm crosses from years past. Draw near. Draw near to the flames. Draw near to God's invitation of transformation and renewal. Lent is more than a season to improve ourselves. Lent is a season of preparation in order to bring forth new life. The transformation promised in Lent looks toward a more graceful kind of renewal. Let the burning of the past, past desires, past situations, past relationships transform into ash. May we grow more radically aware and accept ourselves, our realities, our feelings, and our joys. In these ashes, where things that were once beautiful are now reduced to dust, to the most basic elements. And we know and trust that our God uses those parts in our natural surroundings and in us as raw material to create healing and love. The parts that seem broken are actually soil in which new life grows. And so it is, the old dust and seed and new dirt cooperate to bring about new growth, transformed growth. And as the old palms burnt down, continue to nourish the little seed in the darkness, commingling with newer soil. So it is with us, as we anticipate the year anniversary of the original lockdown order and everything that has felt limiting and restrictive. Let us welcome the silver linings and the terrible darkness of death, destruction, and isolation as we reflect back on the past 11 months. May the past inform our present so that our future together as God's children may be transforming for us and our communities. That's the journey of Lent we take together and in our own very souls. It is the journey that allows seeds of new hope and life to sprout. It's a way to encounter the transformative love of God poured out through the ages to become real in our own lives. Remember that we are dust, and to dust we all shall return. Let us pray.
Righteous God, in humility and repentance, we bring our failures in caring, helping, and loving. We bring the pain we have caused others. We bring the injustice in society of which we are a part to the transforming power of your grace. Grant us the courage to accept the healing you offer and to turn again toward the sunrise of your reign, that we may walk with you in the promise of peace you have willed for all the children of the earth and have made known to us in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes to the people of Corinth, urging them to set their hearts on Christ now. Paul then shares the inner riches of his own faith and life, listing all the ways that God's grace sustains him, even in the most difficult of circumstances. A reading from the second letter to the Corinthians. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled with God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, quote, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you and on a day of salvation I have helped you." End quote. See, now is an acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. 
We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. Through great endurance in inflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
This prophecy from the book of Isaiah was originally written to the residents of Jerusalem, who had returned from a long exile in Babylon to find their home city in ruins. When they cry out to the Lord, they are reminded that prayers are not enough. They must change their hearts and act justly. Then they will find God's power to rebuild their lives and their city. This is a reading from the book of Isaiah. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day, and you oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and to not hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. The greatest gift of the Christian faith and practice is the promise of transformation. In traditional language, we call this the Paschal mystery. Jesus, the Christ, in his life, and death and resurrection reveals to us the ways that God is always at work, bringing life out of death, hope from hopelessness, healing from brokenness, and strength out of weakness. Maybe that's why one of my favorite prayers in the prayer book goes like this. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. Let the whole world see and know which things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is a prayer for the whole church, but it's also a prayer for each individual Christian in their soul. Lent and Easter are the seasons of the church year when faithful people are invited to enter into this mystery of transformation. 
We enter into it first by daring to believe that transformation is possible. That things that have grown old, old ways of being, old ways of relating to friends and foes and strangers, old ways of facing each day can actually be transformed to more life-giving and loving ways. This is a movement of deep faith. It's the foundation of the work of Lent. When we move into this season, we do so with hope and faith that this transformation is possible, that something new can emerge from something old, that something alive can emerge from something that seems dead, that out of the rubble, something new can be rebuilt. Now, Lent, heard this way, can sound maybe just like one more self-improvement project. After all, we've just finished failing at our New Year's resolutions. But the kind of promise, the kind of transformation in Lent is more graceful. It's a different kind of renewal. It's graceful because it begins not with what we feel like is missing, but it begins with a radical self-acceptance, the acceptance of God's grace and the knowledge that God accepts us in our starting place right where we are. And the understanding that God's real desire is to bring communities and individuals into life. How different this can seem than the kind of religion perhaps we were raised with that's based on judgment or disapproval or fear. Not just a perception of God as judge, but the ways in which the demons of self criticism are so much a part of our daily experience. This is not to say that old destructive habits are acceptable. It only understands that God uses those parts of ourselves as part of the raw material to create healing and love in our lives. The parts that are broken are actually part of the soil in which new life grows. If the work of Lent begins with the awareness of those broken and dying places and then moves toward the invitation of the Spirit, then we move into a place where we can be made whole. The work of transformation is a shared work between you and me or the community and the power and guidance of God. Most of you received a gift in the last couple of days at your door. A gift that contained both ashes and seeds. The ashes are the beginning. In a few minutes, you'll be invited to make the sign of the cross on your forehead or on someone else's forehead as a sign of complete trust in God to bring life out of the dust. And then there are the seeds. It's going to take a while for these to sprout. But here at the beginning, we plant these seeds with hope and faith as a sign of God bringing life out of whatever ashes are dead in our souls. We plant with the trust that the God of love will come through. A little foretaste as we Look forward to the Easter feast. Some words from a hymn we'll be singing. 
when our hearts are wintry, grieving, or in pain. Jesus' touch can call us back to life again. Fields of our hearts that dead and bare have been, love is come again like wheat that springeth green. That's the journey of Lent we make together in our souls and together. It's the journey that allows seeds of new hope and new life to sprout. It's a way to encounter the transformative love of God poured out through the ages, just so it might become real in your life, in my life, and in the whole world. Amen. Do you want to see what else is in the box that Julie gave you? Yes. Yeah, let's go check. What else do you have? You got it? What else do we have in the box? Yeah. Ooh, what did you get? Yeah. It's a cross. It's a chocolate. Okay, so we put our cross on our sacred space. Thank you. What else do you have in the box? Look at this. We have a candle. So we put our candle on our sacred space too, maybe by this piece of paper or inside. That works too. So what do we have? We have our cloth, our purple cloth, our pot for our seed. We have our cross for our sacred space. I have my book with prayers. And what do you have there? You know what these are, Ali? These are ashes. You know Ooh, that? look at this spot. Can you turn on our candle? Thank you, Ale. And then we have this other candle that we got from our box, but we're not going to use it, but you can put it next to our candle for our sacred space. <laughs> it's like you're lighting the candle. And then I'm going to take... It's fire now. <laughs> it's lit... Can you put it right there? Can I put our ashes here? Can you draw on my forehead? Yeah. Yeah, come here. I'll show you. You have to use your finger. But first, we gotta pray over these ashes. Did you know that Thomas took some plants, some green plants, and burned it? And these ashes are gonna go on our forehead. We make a sign of the cross like that for Ash Wednesday as a symbol of our repentance. You know what repentance is? Oh, thank you. There you go. And you know what? I'm gonna say a prayer. Can I say a prayer? Yeah. Look, it's from my special prayer book. Are can, we ready? Can we watch Tiana? We're gonna watch it later. Can we do the prayer first? No. Hey, Ale. Almighty God, you have created us out of dust of the earth. Grant that those whose grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and our penitence, that we may remember that it is only by your gracious gift that we are given everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. You don't have it anymore. Oh, I don't have any more. Can you rub it in my forehead just a little more? And then we say, remember that you are dust and to dust you I shall return. You sure did. Thank you for reminding me that we are human, right? Can I do yeah, it on your forehead? I'm human. Yeah. No, I take with me. It does? It does. Okay. Thank you.
Gracious and merciful God, you see into the secret places of our hearts where we mourn our sin. As we turn again to your grace, receive our prayers. We have been lured by the trappings of comfort and certainty and have failed to love and listen to you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved and listened to our neighbors as ourselves. We have not repented or forgiven others as God has forgiven us. We have made plenty of excuses and avoided your call to serve as Christ served us. We confess to you, loving God, all our past unfaithfulness the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives, the ways we are self-indulgent. We confess to you, loving God, the ways in which we hold on to our anger and frustration and grow in jealousy for the things our neighbor appears to be or possesses. We can set fast to you, loving God, our belief that success and achievement make us better than others. Our love of worldly goods and comforts. Our failure to live honestly and tenderly in our daily life and work. Accept our repentance, Lord for the wrongs we have done, for the ways we resist witnessing human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. For all the ways we are greedy, our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, for the ways in which we waste and pollute our common home, for the disregard for the needs of those who come after us. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation. God forgives you, forgive others, forgive yourself. Let us begin this journey of Lent 